Welcome, I'm Lee Cowan, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Comedian Nick Kroll he grew up entertaining his family, but he wasn't sure that would really translate into a career when he moved to L.A. in 2007. As Ben Mankiewicz explains, ever since, he's been on a roll. His wife is drunk. She's babbling nonsense. Kroll has had an enviable last decade in show business. The Supreme Court has agreed to hear our case. <gasps> Producing, oh, writing, and acting. Uh, reservation, uh, Larry David. I, I requested a uh, table uh, by the window. Those were all jobs, good ones too. But his vocation hasn't changed. I'm sorry, but we cannot honor that request. He's a comedian. Shall we? Later in the show, Nick Kroll on his process, crafting a new stand-up bit. I saw you on stage and you were sort of working stuff out, right? I mean, that was stuff that I obviously, at some point you had to write that. How do you do it? Do you record it? Do you? Yeah, I record all my sets, a little, you know, Apple voice memo. And then how do you get it in the first place? Like how, you know, you get that, you had a great, great little microwave bit and the, the sort of like, but do you, where did that come from? Did, did you type it? Did you ever write it? Is it in a notebook like I have this? a tiny or? notebook that yeah. will just say microwave. That's it. Yeah. Then Pendleton wool blankets. They're famous for their quality and designs, inspired by Native American art. Connor Knighton visits one of the final U.S. woolen mills to learn just what makes those blankets so special. Still, that American-made product is pricey. A king blanket can go for $500. If you're looking for a blanket, you can find something at a big box store for $20. Why is somebody spending hundreds of dollars on a Pendleton Well, that, that cheap blanket at a big box store might be around for a few years, and then it's going to be gone. We're creating legacy products that are going to last generations. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Funny man Nick Kroll. He's enjoyed a pretty steady ascent through the Hollywood ranks. He told our Ben Mankiewicz just how he's gone from failed sitcom caveman to working alongside idol Mel Brooks. Where are you guys at with Trump? Honestly, are you got here? Because here's the thing. There's just like something fishy about that guy. Nick Kroll working you know on I another mean? recipe for jokes in the comedy kitchen. I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to vote for him again. After a wildly successful stand-up special last fall. And I'm just never going to be the guy who rides a motorcycle. If I were, I'd be the guy at the back of the pack who's like, oh no, I'm going to miss the light. <laughs> we found Kroll back on stage at Largo, one of LA's hippest nightclubs, trying out new, yet still unrefined material. I am so excited for tonight's show. We have an insane lineup. You guys, Kanye West is here tonight. Were there a couple of things that you know basically worked that will probably likely show up in the next special whenever that is? Yeah, or yes, or at least be the base right. of operations that will be tent poles that I'm like, okay, that joke works well enough to put here. Wow. Wife is drunk, she's babbling nonsense. Kroll has had an enviable last decade in show business. The Supreme Court has agreed to hear our case. <gasps> Producing, oh, writing, and acting. Uh, reservation, uh, Larry David. I, I requested a uh, table uh, by the window. Those were all jobs, good ones too. But his vocation hasn't changed. I'm sorry, but we cannot honor that request. He's a comedian. Shall we? It's like whenever you tell someone, you're like, I'm a comedian, before you're well known, or when people are like, I'm dating a comedian, or I'm a comedian, they're like, oh, how's it going? Right, yeah. You know, you're like, it's actually going pretty well. Right. Um, he forged his identity early, growing up just outside New York City, the youngest of four. My impression of your family, they wouldn't be surprised that, uh, at your career path. No, I think they were, so I was always like performing for them. Like I remember being with my family and just reciting Andrew Dice Clay jokes to them when I was like 11. When do you come out to LA, 2006? Is that 2007, I live in the Oak Woods with a bunch of child stars, not child stars, ch children aspiring to be stars. <laughs> like they had a little deli and there was all these like, like 150 headshots of brooding seven year olds. Just kind of like, I live there. I went on like, I don't know, 30 auditions for pilots. And the final one I went on was for this show called Cavemen. 
It's so easy to use Geico.com, a caveman could do Inspired it. by the popular Geico commercials. Like not cool. The ABC sitcom Caveman failed to evolve. Oh, hi. Uh, coffee and a donut, please. Excuse me? He wants an Americano and a beignet. Canceled so after just seven episodes. Beloved commercials, uh, despised show. <laughs> it has it has moments. It's not bad. No, it's not bad. No, at it's all. funny. I mean, it's like I'm like I'm I still stand by. I'm like that's as funny right. as any Nothing other to be show. Nothing ashamed of no. at all. Right. So it didn't feel like failure to you. It didn't. Well, it didn't feel like personal failure. It felt like I'm participating in a failure. Yeah. Right. Which is it's different. It's different. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Kroll is philosophical about failure. My dear friend Maya Angelou said. <laughs> um, <laughs> If you don't pick up the compliments, then you don't have to pick up the criticisms. Right, yeah. So it's like, how much do you let in? If you don't let in all the good stuff, if you just don't let other people's opinions sway you too much. Is there enough room for some mayonnaise in this lady's sandwich? Oh, Kroll Leslie, kept working. Free shot. I'm not even touching the Fussenschaft. With a steady diet of supporting roles on TV. Whoa, Along the way, he found a strength writing and playing outlandish characters. From a crass lawyer playing fantasy football with his friends in the league. Darren Sproles, good pick, Darren good job. Sproles, no, 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 that's who I was gonna pick. Who cares, he picked Darren Sproles, He could have picked Bill Shatner, he doesn't know what the difference is. I think of myself as like a very cool, very white Jay-Z. Yeah, to a tacky, yeah. sure overconfident we'll entrepreneur. Wow. Okay, I'm Bobby Bottle Service, AKA Bobby Bottle Service. Bobby Bottle Service eventually became a fixture on Kroll's self-titled sketch comedy show. In a related note, excuse me, are you 9-11? No. Because I could never forget you. I'm going home. You guys are repulsive. Kroll show ran for three seasons on Comedy Central. It was easier to be a character. It's like you could put on silly sunglasses and a funny, you know, shirt and silly pants and become someone else. For breakfast, we'll do something cool, like have a cigarette and like a bar of chocolate. So that if someone didn't want. like it, it wasn't like they didn't like Nick Kroll. And it gave me a freedom and confidence to, to say things and do things that were tr harder for me to do as myself. Oh, hello. These days, Kroll is putting the final touches on his sketch comedy show for Hulu, History of the World Part Two, a limited series sequel to the 1981 Mel Brooks comedy. Get your mud pies from me, schmuck mud men, made with the abject suffering and eczema of the Jewish diaspora. It's the same sketch style with an updated cast, including Wanda Sykes and Ike Barinholtz. Who is this? It's your mama. If you're my mother, what is your last name? Mel. It's my mother. That confirms it. For Kroll, it's a chance not only to collaborate with his friends and peers, but to work with his comedy hero. Mel Brooks. How important was Mel Brooks to young Nick Kroll? It's Mel Brooks and Saturday Night Live, but Mel Brooks's movies, to me, we owned, you know, we owned History of the World on VHS. We owned Young Frankenstein, Blazing Saddles, and The Producers. Talk about bad taste. I watched The Producers basically every day as I became a teenager for like three or four years. There's a school of thought in Hollywood these days hey, boys. that Brooks's brand of comedy isn't 2023 friendly. Hey, where are the white women at? That movies like Blazing Saddles couldn't be made today in an era when comedians like Kroll have to watch what they say. But I don't think it's limiting. I just think it's like any anything else. There's just challenges that have to be figured out, and the ones who are the best figure out how to continue to shock and surprise, and also be mindful of the time and place that we live. Some call me Jesus Christ, son of God. Some call him broken corny. That woman is enchanting. However, we can figure out how to keep that connection with an audience where you are surprising them into laughter is the ultimate goal. If this was on Netfish, I would cancel my subscription. The journey is figuring out how to do that. Up next, an exclusive excerpt from Nick Kroll's chat. It just meant Something you can see only right here on CBS News Stream. Stay with us.
As promised, here's more from Ben Mankiewicz and Nick Kroll. I don't usually start interviews this way, but I mean, congratulations. This is a, you're on a prolonged run <laughs> of good things. Uh, thank you. You don't normally start interviews that way? No, usually most people I, I talk to are, are deadbeats at the end of their careers. So it's, <laughs> yeah, it's just a... I look forward to having that version of the conversation in three years' time. Things have been, what would you say, uh, things have been going very well for, I mean, five, six, seven, seven five, <laughs> a, long, a long time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have you found, has there been joy and, and peace as, as, you, <laughs> as you rocket up the, well, up the I would comedy say, food chain? Thank yeah. you for saying that. I would say it's, my, I feel like my career has been incredibly fortunate in that it hasn't been a direct rocket. It's been a constant, like, it, you might call it like on the the roller coaster on the way up. I always describe it to people like nobody goes like this. I yeah. mean, at, what you sort of hope for is that is the pits that, that yes. oh look at this I'm here and I used to be here. Yes, right. And that yeah. for sure is it. And there are some ebbs and flows inside of it, but I've been very fortunate and steady. And I there are times where I've been watch my peers who have rocket, you know, had really fast trajectories, and at times I've been jealous of that of that rocket, you know, but, but now looking back, and I think that's the thing as you get older is you're like, oh, that, that, that has a lot like, you know, if you, if you're scuba diving, you shoot up 50 meters, you're going to get the bends. Right. And so that's why I don't scuba, I just snorkel and I can see a couple of fish <laughs> along the way. <laughs> and that's good enough. I saw you on stage and you were sort of working stuff out, right? I mean, that was stuff that I obviously, at some point you had to write that. How do you do it? Do you record it? Do you? Yeah, I record all my sets, a little, you know, Apple voice memo. And mm -hmm. then how do you get it in the first place? Like how, you know, you get that, you had a great, a great little microwave bit and the, the sort of like, but do you, where did that come from? Did, did you type it? Did you ever write it? Is it in a notebook like I have this? a or? tiny notebook that yeah. will just say microwave. That's it. Yeah, and then slowly as I develop the joke, then I'll start to kind of write out beats or I'll, I'll write down what I've improvised on stage that night and been like microwave, TV, da da da. And then I'll start to eventually write it out, but then it becomes muscle memory on some level. Sure, but the initial, the crafting of it from note about microwave, mm -hmm. the, the, that's on a stage, somewhere on a stage and then you're recording it and then you write it down after, but it's the, the bulk of the creativity is happening on. Yes, I mean, I will come up with the idea of like, I wanna talk about microwaves tonight, let's see what comes out. And then it's like, oh, th of the four useless minutes on microwaves, 30 seconds of that are useful, that stays in. And then you start building it that way. And frankly, it's the same on some level with history of the world where, you know, I, you know, the, the way the show is broken up is there are these, like the movie, there are these bigger chunks. I talked to a lot of people, many of them older, but some of them uh, more or less our age, whose parents were, you know, not supportive, didn't believe in them. And I guess that almost to a person drove them in, in some way. When your parents are supportive and they're there for you and they believe in you, it is hard to quantify the benefits of that. Very much so. So much of my success, I come from privilege. And I knew that if I didn't make it as a comedian, there would be some other job, some other world that I would be able to do something based on the schools I went to, the connections that I could have access to. I knew that I would not drown if I didn't make it in show business, which gave me an, a tremendous latitude to go for it. Even if you don't think about it that way, you just sort of know. In the back of your mind, I, if I don't make it, this isn't the end of the world. But more than that, that I wasn't fighting an uphill battle against whether I thought my family loved me or supported me is massive. It just meant that I could enter a room or get on a stage and feel somewhere deep in my core that I was loved, and that's a massive advantage that I feel like I had. Yeah, yeah I think it is. And, 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 and you know, the people who I love and care about who didn't have it, you see it, you see what, yeah. it, what it does. To and them. many it's of a, them fight through it and it oh. fuels them tremendously. Yeah, but it is a, it's an absence. That yes. is, it's an absence that they have to overcome and then, and, and then they overcome it, but it's still an absence. Yes, yeah. and I, that was like, it's, I think it's so much, and I go back to like being on, being cavemen, any job you have, you have to do everything for the first time once, right? So like, 
and then you're like, okay, the next time I'm on set, I know that I need to listen to that writer. I know that the sound guy doesn't want me to hit my chest, but I don't care what the sound guy says right now. I need to hit my chest in this. Right. But the first time I'm on set, I'm, I'm not doing what I want to do because I think I'm going to get in trouble with the sound guy. Right. All due respect, sound guy. Right, right, totally, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, you're, we're constantly navigating, like, how do we get rid of the noise around us? And the, the absence of love is a, <laughs> is a massive noise that can distract us from doing the thing that we actually want to do. Up next, a blanket woven into the fabric of America. Welcome back. Pendleton has been making their signature blankets for nearly a century. And long before they were in living rooms, they became an important piece of Native American culture. Here's Connor Knight. Row by row, thread by thread, this mill in Eastern Oregon has been weaving wool for more than a century. It is, quite literally, part of the fabric of the community. The town's name, Pendleton, is stitched into every product. Back in the 1880s, 1870s, there were three million sheep in the neighborhood. Well, that's a lot of sheep. Bob Christnacht is the executive vice president of sales and marketing for Pendleton Woolen Mills. In the early 1900s, the company was started by the Bishop Brothers, who came to town to try their hand at the blanket business. Everything you see in this mill has a story behind it, and probably two or three stories. It's what makes us so unique is the legacy behind the patterns that we make. Those patterns were designed to appeal to Pendleton's first customers, Native Americans. The relationship may seem like it's just a retail relationship, but it's many more layers. Bobby Connor is the director of the Temascalit Cultural Institute, located on the Umatilla Indian Reservation, just outside Pendleton. The first recorded interaction in our homeland with Euro-Americans is Lewis and Clark in 1805. We came to know a few other explorers who came in their wake, and then the Hudson's Bay Company set up a trading post in our homeland in 1816. That's where our love of wool was born. Those early companies exchanged what became known as trade blankets. If you've ever worn a wet leather jacket, you know the difference between the weight of that and the weight of a wool coat. And so wool was durable, worked in more than one season. But it was more than a functional fabric. Native Americans began using prized Pendleton blankets to mark special occasions, a tradition that continues to this day. Many are born to Pendleton, laid to rest in Pendleton, presented a Pendleton as a ceremonial blanket around the bride and groom at an Indian wedding. Whenever a blanket began to show its age, it was given new life. We have been repurposing Pendleton wool forever. My aunt made, when I was in college, cut up and made Pendleton wool pillows as, you know, sort of keepsakes from home. Of course, part of the reason the blankets originally appealed to Native Americans was that they featured the types of geometric designs that were already common in indigenous art. Something that might have once been presented as borrowing today is talked about in terms of appropriation. Do you see it as appropriation? The idea that I might come and take a picture of something prized and handmade that you wear and turn that into a design without acknowledging the maker, without having a relationship with the person who created it, and then taking that and turn that into a retail product, we would consider disrespectful. The respectful thing to do is to talk to me and talk about that relationship and what that might be. And that's, I think, what Pendleton in its most recent decades has become is a purveyor of goods that are created out of relationships with tribal people. Today, Pendleton has added designs made by contemporary Native American artists and has a series of items that's raised over a million dollars for the American Indian College Fund. The business has also expanded far beyond blankets. We're not just a blanket company anymore. We're more of a a home business, and that was really important to us. And then Pendleton CEO John Bishop has been around for over 100 years. Is the fifth generation of his family to be involved in the textile industry. 
Pendleton started making apparel in the 1920s, but it wasn't until the 1960s when one of its plaid shirts really took off, thanks to its unexpected popularity with some Southern California surfers. This is the Beach Boy plaid. It was featured on the album cover of Surfing Safari. Before they became the Beach Boys, the band was briefly named the Pendletones. Surfers used wool to keep warm at the beach. The dude. Who is more relaxed than the dude? Right. Right. <laughs> Jeff Bridges wore a Pendleton sweater in The Big Lebowski. Today, the dude sweater is one of the company's top sellers. Like most of Pendleton's apparel, it's manufactured overseas. But the bulk of the blanket business remains in the Pacific Northwest, where some patterns are still created with punch card looms that are decades old. Pendleton's woolen mills are some of the only ones left in a country that once had thousands. Why do you think Pendleton survived when so many other mills went out of business? Because we have a brand we're selling to consumers directly. In the early 80s, there were roughly 25 mills in the U.S., and now there's three of us. All of those mills, you know, they sold to apparel manufacturers. And the apparel manufacturers, they're still in business because they moved offshore. Still, that American-made product is pricey. A king blanket can go for $500. If you're looking for a blanket, you can find something at a big box store for $20. Why is somebody spending hundreds of dollars on a Pendleton Well, that, that cheap blanket in a big box store might be around for a few years, and then it's going to be gone. We're creating legacy products that are going to last generations. For Bobby Connor, they're a way to connect with family. I have a Pendleton blanket for each of my uncles who's passed away that was given to me either by the uncle during my lifetime or given to me by his family when he passed away. A blanket given to mark a graduation, a marriage, or a death is a way to tell a story. Each one provides a thread to the past. It's the treasures of your life that represent the people who are important to you. I'm Lee Cowan. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you right here next time on Here Comes the Sun.